He threw a leg across that iron horse and pulled the throttle down. A million things rushing through his mind like that rumbling sound. Living life in his own eyes, direction isn't clear. So searching, searching all these years. Welcome to Answers from Mars Hill. This is Pastor Ski of the Rushing Wind Biker Church in Holbrook, New York, and New York State Elder, Bikers of Christ Motorcycle Ministry. Welcome to today's show. Um, what I want to do for, uh, for a few minutes, maybe until the first break, you know, we're, uh, we're in a very uh, interesting time in our world today. And, uh, you know, we've, we've had questions that have come in the past, and I kind of talked about how does God work, uh, how can, can God be good when there's a lot of uh, challenging things going on. And I think uh, today what the world go is going through uh, our country, our communities, uh, even our, our churches. This is uh, kind of a case study of, uh, of one of the, the things that I've really talked about. You know, we, uh, we have this uh, pandemic, uh, this COVID-19, the, uh, the coronavirus, that has, uh, has really brought the world, uh, it seems, to its knees uh, as, uh, as uh, it spreads and becomes just a big part of our, our day, a part of our life, a part of our communities, our so social gatherings. And so it's amazing how something so microscopic can come into this uh, humanity and just create such havoc. You know, I, I talked about in the past how uh, no, nothing that, that really happens in this realm is, is God's fault. It all goes back to when we first fell and we've been corrupting this planet. We've been corrupting ourselves. Um, the... Uh, social interaction and, and just over the, the millennium this, uh, this whole human experience has really become uh, a very challenging and treacherous existence. And now we're in this place where, you know, you pick up the, the, the scriptures of the Bible and even historically you hear about these things called uh, plagues or uh, pestilence. Uh, as it is called in, in the Bible. And, you know, we're so disconnected from a lot of these things that went on in the world in the past. Uh, well, uh, welcome, to, uh, welcome to reality of this, uh, this life on the human realm. We now have this, uh, this pandemic, this disease. And, you know, this is always a, a, a test of, of our humanity. It's a test of our faith as, as uh, believers in Jesus Christ and uh, Christians. And, you know, I, I always try to bring the perspective of the faith that, uh, that I hold dear. And I think, um, I think if someone really is in this faith, they can at least understand and, uh, and maybe not walk in fear. You know, right now, everyone is gripped with fear. Uh, the world is is looking at this unseen enemy. And maybe the, the, the most uh, frightening thing that we can experience in this life is an enemy we can't see. We don't know where it is. We don't know where it's coming from. We don't know who has it, who doesn't have it. And uh, I think the necessity of having uh, a faith, uh, a God, something to believe in, uh, something to hold on to that uh, that things can be good again, or even if things are good right now, can be uh, can be a reality. I, I've uh, I've seen a lot of a lot of people people of faith where uh, they're really as as scared and as afraid as as anyone else in the in the world that doesn't have a God to put their their faith into, and it's uh, it's really a test of all of us, but. As I uh, as I wake up every morning, you know you uh, you kind of dust off the 
the dirt from yesterday's challenges and walk into today with eyes wide open. I've had to kind of re-examine how I've uh, I've had to do things. You know, uh, I have uh, I'm in a place where you know do I have any uh, anxiety and fear about what's going on? Uh, not really, but I have concern, and, and especially being a pastor, uh, people I need to uh, to keep uh, keep in a healthy place, uh, protect them. Uh, it's kind of easy protecting uh, people from spiritual things, maybe uh, from uh, physical things, and now we have this third dimension that uh, we're trying to navigate through: how to walk in faith, be bold, not have fear not let the things of this world um, dictate our life. And it becomes this, this juggling act sometimes of uh, wisdom and faith. And so as, uh, as I kind of talk from a perspective of, uh, of Christianity and the faith that I have, uh, I know that God is in control. I know that God didn't cause this. I know that uh, we created this quagmire of... Uh, of, uh, of just problems. And this is something that we're being allowed to go through as, as a, a humanity, as a culture. And it's really a test of, uh, of Christians. You know, um, Christianity and Jesus was brought to this realm really for a time such as this, when something grips uh, the soul, grips the human mind and spirit in such a way that uh, that there's no hope, there's fear, there's anxiety, there's stress. We see uh, restaurants closing, businesses closing, people's paychecks are not coming in. On top of that, they don't know who they can be around, who they can be close to. And the uh, the reason Jesus came, and really the strength of this faith when you really step into it, is to give us peace and to give us uh, calm, and also to bring wisdom. You know, there's a, a lot of uh, wisdom in the Bible on how to navigate through these things. And, uh, you know, I can be one to not walk in, in absolute wisdom. I just want to plow through. Sometimes, um, you know, a faith can get to a, a point where, uh, is it faith or is it, um, you know, is it stupidity at times? And uh, I, I can be prone to that. And so it's, uh, it's challenged me with how to navigate through wisdom and faith, knowing God is good. But God is, God is going to get us through this. Uh, he always has. Uh, he always will. You know, I've had uh, several emails from people, in, even in the bike community, uh, because people like to dabble in the Bible, especially when it comes to conversations about the end of days, uh, the book of Revelation. Uh, the end times, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And so I've had some pretty interesting um, interesting emails and, uh, and people have questions and like, what do you think, Ski? What, what, are, we, what are we going through right now? Uh, is this it? Is this, you know? And uh, it's great to get the questions, but, uh, you know, we need to understand just the truth of, of where uh, God is in this whole thing. Uh, do I believe we're near the end? I don't think we're, we're close to the end. I think... Um, unfortunately, when that time comes, it's going to be a, a heck of a lot worse than it is right now. And so um, this is a, a test of, of humanity. It's a test of Christianity, faith. People that aren't uh, part of the Christian faith, uh, I think God's going to use this to kind of maybe put kind of curiosity question marks of, uh, of uh, you know, maybe I can hold on to this in this time of, uh, time of need, that this reality of Jesus and you know, the people who are really in this faith have, have seemed to walk a little bit differently. But I want to encourage uh, everyone out there that, uh, that God still cares. God, uh, God loves everyone. He uh, uses these over, over history uh, and things like this that happen in our humanity to draw people to him. And so, uh, you know, where you go with all this, you know, uh, we all have to process our, our anxiety, uh, our fears, our questions um, in this really, really complicated time uh, in all of our lives, no matter what, what age we are. You know, you know I'm going to be 64 years old soon, and, 
uh, I've been through a couple of things. You know, we had another pandemic in, uh, uh, I don't know, 2009, somewhere around there. We had 9-11. We had Y2K. Um, and so, you know, I've been through uh, the assassination of, uh, of John F. Kennedy. Uh, and so there's been a lot of things that have, uh, have really crashed into this world uh, in my lifetime. And so uh, this, again, is a, is a test. And, and uh, we have a resilient nation. Um, but God is still uh, sovereign. And, you know, this may be one of those opportunities, like I said, coming from a, um, a pure Christian faith. Uh, not, not, maybe that's not the right word, but, um, I mean, I really have given everything in my life to this faith, and I stand in a, a place where, you know, I'm just not feeling as uh, unhinged as, as, as most people are. It might be a time for some of us to, uh, to kind of think, you know, maybe we want to check out this, uh, this faith in Jesus, this Christianity, um, or not. This is, you know, your life to navigate through. Um, I can just uh, explain what uh, Jesus is, has done in my life and right now in particular. You know, uh, going through cancer two and a half years ago, uh, actually it's coming, coming on to almost three years um, and really, I ha hadn't had a lot of uh, anxiety and fear through that. And uh, I've seen God come, come through in huge ways, in miraculous ways. And one of the time, that's kind of a, you know, I was speaking to someone else that this is like a biblical moment. You know, we read about plagues and things in the Bible and, and pestilence and, and how people overcame and how they rebounded. People, their faith came back. And uh, right now, it's an important time for Christian values. Uh, community, taking care of each other, loving each other, serving each other. Um, don't be going into the store hoarding because it just shows how corrupt this humanity is. You know, start thinking about other people. That, again, is something that ideal is a Christian ideal. Is it just a Christian ideal? Maybe not. But I think if we can all come together with certain principles that, that really came out of uh, how Jesus wanted to change the world, we can help uh, this world recover our country, our, uh, our nation, our communities, and even our families. So um, we're going to start with another question right after a word from our sponsors. Hey, everybody. This is Motorcycle Mike, the personal injury lawyer. I've been riding motorcycles my entire adult life. During the course of my 30-year career as a lawyer, I've also represented countless injured motorcyclists. If you're one of them, I can be of assistance to you. Go to my website, please, MotorcycleMikeESQ.com. I'll always be there for you. I'm on your side when you ride. Welcome to Wolfman's Bike of the I'm Kenny the Wolfman Max. And right now I'm going to bring you a brand new jacket in for the ladies. An embroidered jacket that just hasn't been out yet. This is the first time. The Flying Angel. And the ever popular Brando jacket. It's been around for a hundred years and will be around for a hundred more. I've got hundreds and hundreds in stock. Don't forget our large selection of sunglasses. I've got all types of jewelry. Ladies biker jewelry. Uh, silver. Rings. Hundreds of men's rings. We've got it all. Everything is here, right here. Wolfman's Biker Letter, 335 Smithtown Boulevard in Ron Cockerell. My phone number is 631-578-7877. 631-578-7877. Welcome back to Answers from Mars Hill. This is Pastor Ski again from the Russian Wind Biker Church. And um, 
you know, we spent that first section speaking about kind of what, what's going on right now with this, uh, this coronavirus. And so we're going to shift now. I think next week we may, uh, may have a, a longer conversation about just uh, everything we're going through right now uh, in this world. But right now we want to take a few questions that have been sent in. And uh, this is my producer, Bobby, in the corner there. And uh, he's got the questions. And uh, let's see what you got, Bobby. All right. So um, first question I want to start with, and um, this actually comes from me. It's something that uh, I've always wondered, and uh, it's, a, it's regarding children. And, you know, why, why do you think innocent, innocent children have to suffer with terminal diseases such as cancer? Um, is this part of God's plan? Um, it's, it's so sad to, to watch children, you know, encounter these diseases, but yet it's so amazing at the same time, how the, the bravery and, and the strength that they have, mm -hmm. um, it's just, what, what are your thoughts of that? You know, just children, innocent children, you know, yeah. being inflicted by, by things like, uh, cancer and stuff like yeah. that. Well, everything we're going through in this this realm is really a result of what we have done to uh, corrupt this whole humanity. You know, God never intended any of this. Um, God intended for us to be healthy, have life, and uh, life more abundant, as, as Jesus uh, had put it. But what happened after the fall, and I've spoken about this before, is generation by generation, the... Uh, the human experience kept getting more corrupt and corrupt because of our, our tendencies to be selfish people, hateful people. Uh, what the Bible calls sin are just really kind of ins in, uh, insensitive or unsensitive social, um, social treachery, um, selfishness, and all these things that went on. And then on top of that, uh, because of uh, death and the corruption, really biologically, um, chemically with our planet i spoke i think last week about what happened when the flood came and all the waters that were really in the uh, the atmosphere came flooding to the earth and uh, and then brought all that death all that corruption all the the decay of of just uh, humanity and animals and and then we've lost uh, our protection from uh, from the sun and so all these things have brought uh, disease death the lifespan went down tremendously and so every human being that steps into this realm is, is experiencing part of that really death of, of humanity. Oops, dropped something. And so um, what, uh, what happens is no one is exempt. You know, someone may be born with something. I've spoken about my sister that was born with, uh, with a birth defect. And, uh, and she had to be given medication and she had a um, had a call, went to a coma, and she's really been in a vegetative state from um, earlier than four years old now to uh, somewhere around 46, 47, I believe. And so um, is this God's plan? No, it's not God's plan. God has uh, allowed us and informed us over the generations to do things to try to uh, redeem part of our existence with... Uh, with science and health and medicine and things that that he has uh, really informed people through intelligence and uh, really gifts of being able to analyze this this human body, but um, you know God never planned any of this. So as far as this being part of God's plan, uh, no, it's not part of God's plan. Uh, again, we've always had free choice, and so it's the um, the amplification of free choice. For generations, that has created this. So now, when uh, when a child is born with a birth defect, or if someone dies, and I have several people that have been close to me that have uh, had either their children that have come down with uh, fatal diseases, or or people they're very close to, that um, that it's the result of this broken, even genetic humanity. And and God's uh, God's plan is a plan of redemption. And so, um, again, from a Christian perspective, everything we view is from the eternal. It's what happens here is not, 
the, uh, the entirety of our life. And as a matter of fact, it's a, a very small part. You know, the Bible says, what is life but a breath? You know, it's just you, you blink, blink your eye and, and it's gone in, in relation to our whole existence in, in eternity. And so, uh, you know, you look at children and, you know, there, there are different philosophies on children and faith and heaven and hell. And, and some of that has even been kind of morphed within certain religious perspectives. You know, I remember when I was uh, growing up, uh, the denomination I was in had this place called Limbo that was for children who died in sin or, or however that was perceived. But when you really think of how uh, God talks about children, how Jesus talks about children, uh, I believe that it's, it's clear that children, uh, until they can uh, arrive at an age where they can make an educated decision for themselves on... Uh, accepting Christianity, accepting faith in Jesus, or, or however, you know, you view that experience, that they're in a place of grace until the point that they can make up their own decision. Because God is not a, uh, a, a, an unfair God. God is not an evil God. God is love and compassionate. And if you think about it, that would be the only fair God, would be one that would uh, keep children in grace until they can decide for themselves. Uh, whether they want to accept the gift of salvation and who Jesus was uh, was sent to be, and so when you you think about children who uh, who go through this these diseases, and I watched my my sister go through um, a long time where she was actually in a powerful place to be used by God for people to to be seen to come to a place of compassion, understanding. You know this question itself really leads to a heart that's open to, you know, my heart breaks and I want some kind of answers. And, you know, God does give us understanding, um, you know, and it's not always that that person's going to be healed, that child's going to be healed, but understanding of the big picture. And so, uh, you know, I do believe that children, and I, I kind of, beyond belief, I, I, I'm confident that children that go through things, um, they're going to suffer in this life just like, most of us do, all of us do to some extent. It's really challenging to watch a young person. Uh, what did they do? What did they do to, um, to have this thrown on them? Um, well, they're part of our humanity that we messed up. And we have to understand that, uh, that God still has compassion, mercy, and provision for the children. And, uh, you know, the Bible says... Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, prevent not a child to come unto me, Jesus said. Um, and children, if something happens to them at, at an age before accountability, which is kind of the word we use, um, they will be with Jesus in heaven, just like those that we believe in our faith that have given their life to Jesus, made that conscious decision. Um, and suffering is never wasted in this human realm. You know, God, God will leverage suffering for his purpose, which is to draw people to him, to uh, maybe bring people to a place of, of pain and suffering and sorrow and grieving, that they reach out, that he can actually speak to them, touch them, show them, uh, inform them, and, uh, and give them revelation. And so uh, these things that we see that are part of suffering, particularly with children, tend to uh, bring the, the biggest, toughest of, of us to a place of... Uh, of crying and weeping and compassion and, you know, even getting angry, wanting the answers. And so when we, uh, when we think about, you know, are children innocent? Well, they're innocent uh, as much as, you know, someone else who hasn't done anything in their life and gone and had a good life and they come down with cancer also. Um, we, we obviously look at youth uh, a little differently because someone hasn't been able to live their whole life. And I think that's where we, we have the real pain that, you know, like what we would have liked them to live and enjoy and, and the parts of this humanity that, that it's not fair. You know, but from the Christian perspective, the life that we step into when we're out of this realm is somewhat more extraordinary, um, eternal, 
And so, uh, you know, we kind of look at things differently. Yes, we grieve and we mourn because children are children, and uh, we all love them, we all have compassion, and uh, that's important part of our humanity. But beyond the grief and beyond the, uh, the sorrow and pain and even anger is an awareness that there's something greater that awaits us after this life. And so, you know, I've lost several siblings, uh, three really within a week after they were born. And so I know they were here for a week and maybe they suffered and they had a hard life. I don't know the parameters because I was too young. But the moment their, their heart stopped, the moment they took their last breath, they were in the most extraordinary experience, the most extraordinary life that could ever be in, in existence. And, um, and, and, and I know that one day I'll get to be with all my, my siblings that I've never even really met. You know, and, uh, and my, um, my uncle who was, you know, was killed, my other uncle, and, and uh, even the, the, the children that my mother miscarried. You know, they're all, they're all there. And, uh, you know, in the womb, life is there. And so when someone has miscarriage um, and, uh, and something happens before a child is actually born, um, they're uh, in heaven and uh, in, it's a great place with Jesus. And, and so, um, you know, that's a great encouragement we have in our faith. And, um, and so I hope that that answers the question of how to process this whole thing of pain and suffering with children, uh, what's fair, what's unfair. It's a hard perspective, but it's a, it, is, um, it is an answer for some of the hard things in this life. And so um, I want to take a break for, uh, for a minute or two for some of our sponsors and uh, address another question after this. Hi, my name is Sharon, Sharon Gillette, and I'm the owner of One Stitch at a Time. I've been doing this since I'm nine years old, but it became full-time when my husband was diagnosed with cancer several years ago and I never went back to work because I wanted to take care of him. I feel what makes me stand out is that I care. I take a personal interest in your project. I take the time to find your correct fit and treat you like a friend, not just a customer. So whether it's embroidery, making patches, printing shirts, doing alterations and repairs, or bringing your ideas to life, you can call me at 631-428-1245 or visit my website at www.onestitchatatime.co. Welcome back to Answers from Mars Hill. Uh, again, this is Pastor Ski from the, uh, the Russian Wing Biker Church in Holbrook, New York. And, uh, you know, the question we, uh, we addressed before the last break, I believe that Bobby has, uh, Bobby, uh, yeah, Bobby has, uh, has something that he, uh, he wanted me to expand on with that thought. So uh, what was it you wanted to, to ask about? Okay. So um, I just wanted to add on, you know, because we were talking about children. And obviously when children get sick, I mean, that's just heartbreaking because they children really are, you know, the most innocent creatures. They haven't even had the chance to, you know, to live life and, and they're afflicted by, you know, these terminal illnesses. And it's, it's so sad and hard to understand. Um, but, you know... I, for instance, a couple months ago, a friend of mine posted on Facebook, I guess he lost a friend 
to uh, cancer or some sort of illness, and he posted something to the effect, you know, how could God do this, you know, take away this great person, is my, my best friend? And, um, you know, I, I he's a good friend of mine, and I ended up calling him up and just, you know, my opinion on, on this, you know, all these these diseases and everything in this world today that we're, we're fighting, you know, this was all brought on, you know, by us as, as humans. I mean, my opinion, God gave us the, the most beautiful earth, the, this perfect world to live in. And as human beings, we made such poor choices over time, you know, with, with, with food, you know, additives and preservatives and, and things that we did with manufacturing the environment, with water and everything like that. And do you feel the, the same way that all the stuff that we're dealing with, we're fighting all these diseases and, and toxins and everything, is that God's doing or is, is that our doing? Did we well, mess up something? Well, as I mentioned before the break, we, we messed up this planet. And, and on top of that, um, as we move into like the Industrial Revolution, we move into today's kind of world, um, we're in kind of a fast, you know, like I want it, I want it now. And we're in a very materialistic and, um, you know, kind of everybody wants more and they want more and they want more. And so you know, they make decisions of, of how do we get more out of less instead of trusting in God's provision even with uh, agriculture, with, um, with how we raise, you know, they're, they're pumping up uh, GMOs in, uh, in animals, you know, and uh, they're using all kinds of artificially developed things to try to produce more out of less rather than allow God's, God's creation to have the natural process of things. You know, uh, the, uh, the cancer that I have, I'm in remission, and, uh, you know, I had a, a battle for a while, uh, two years ago. But I'm part of this, this lawsuit now with this, uh, this product called Roundup. Because um, the cancer that I have is one of the premier ones and a very um, rare one that has been linked to this, um, this weed killer. Mm. And, uh, you know, you see these farmers and all these people who are, have been using it. Um, now, is it neglect? I don't know if companies like Monsanto and these companies that, you know, they don't tell you everything. You know, it's like how many people smoked cigarettes and they never had the warning on the label. You know, I remember growing up and, you know, it was the Marlboro Man, you know, and, uh, and there were all these advertisements that, uh, that was pushing this thing, which was very addictive and was killing us, maybe in ways that we didn't even know at the time. And so, you, you know, you look at artificial sweeteners, you look at all these things that we have tried to, uh, you know, how do I get healthy? Well, I don't want to eat healthy, so I'm going to use artificial sweeteners so I don't have sugar. And I'm going to eat, I'm going to create something that I can take the, the fattening part of this, but now I'm pumping myself with a chemical mm. part of this. And, and going back generations and generations and, you know, where it all started, I don't know, but... All these things are, we've brought more death, more poisons into our environment. Some of it lies dormant within, uh, within genetic codes that may not hit for the next generation. You know, uh, what, what I have wasn't something genetic, but a lot of uh, cancer can run in families. We know diabetes can run in families. And so this is stuff we've done to ourselves because of the abuse of this life, because of you know, the, the, the gluttony of life and maybe even food that has caused us to want to find shortcuts to, to be what is perceived healthy but messing up our genetic makeup. And so, um, you know, when we start looking at, you know, why is all these cancer things coming around? Why is this, you know, this coronavirus? Uh, where did it come from? Well, people playing with things in, in a lab who knows what they were trying to create, what they were trying to prove, and, uh, and now we're here. And so God didn't cause any of this. God didn't cause any of this. You know, um, what God did from the Christian perspective, he's trying to give us his best life we can here, keep us in peace and joy above 
the, the, the wreckage that this is, but also with the promise that, you know, eternity is eternity. And so this is just really, you know, a small part of our existence. And so, uh, no, God has not caused any of this. God's, God's a redeeming God. And sometimes he heals. Sometimes he brings us to a mindset where we can uh, start to live a better life. But in the end, the people that reach out to God, the God of the Bible, the God that I believe in, uh, sent Jesus, that he will redeem everything in the end. But he caused none of this, and he's been trying to redeem it and using us to redeem it, which is challenging enough as it is, because uh, we're fighting what we want and what God would like and how to redeem this with love and compassion and wisdom and all this other stuff, and, uh, and you know, we're having problems with it. And so, uh, no, God doesn't cause things like that, and it's important for us as we go through these losses and these things that we need compassion uh, for to, um, to process it correctly. You know, ask God the, uh, the questions, but let him, um, let him let us know how this all works and how we can look at it in a healthy way so that the stuff that comes into people we love's lives, whether it's cancer, whether it's I love both my parents to cancer, my sister, all right, how can I go on and have a good life and, you know, put my head on the pillow at night when, when all this stuff is going on around me? And that's the difference that this faith uh, that I've, uh, I've really dove into Christianity gives us, is how we can, right now with this craziness that's going on in the world, people are scared to death. Um, you know, if I live, it's great. If I die, it's great. Uh, I'm going to do what I can, and I'm not going to be afraid. I'm going to use wisdom. I'm not going to go out there into big crowds and do all this stuff. You know, we've had to make decisions with our church. Um, but life is still great. Life is still great. And, uh, and that's because of God, uh, not the, the wreckage and the dark stuff. So uh, I'm, glad, uh, I'm glad to uh, kind of expound on that a little bit. Yeah, I agree. I agree with you 100%. And um, what could you recommend to, to people? Like you said, people want everything so fast. They don't want to wait. Um, we, we don't want to have too much sugar, so we, we use sweet and low and all these other things, which are chemicals, which are hurting us. Is it, is it all about eating healthy and natural and moderation? Like, can you take a couple minutes and just uh, maybe give people some advice on how to um, maneuver through all this well, this products that we're being... I, I believe know? that um, all these battles we have in our life really come down to a spiritual battle. You know, my sin issue, if you will, is, uh, is gluttony. You know, my whole life, eating is how I dealt with stress and how I dealt with everything. And it becomes to a point where, you know, you have to find some kind of discipline to, uh, to deal with the things that are driving you to, to eat more and to, to have more sugar and, and to whatever else it is. It could be alcohol, it could be whatever it is. And that's where, you know, um, faith and drawing closer to God and allowing him to kind of help us be stripped of these addictions. You know, the thing is, we all, we all have, um, have a, uh, addictive personalities. We all have these things in us. And the thing is to, to shift to where we're actually craving things that are better for us. You know, it's like instead of watching violence on television, which kind of messes our, our mind up anyway in one way or another, but kind of gravitate towards things that are better so that we can have a better outlook, a, a more positive, um, a just life is good. And it's almost impossible without God. I mean, Paul talks about this in the fourth chapter of Philippians. You know, think about things that are good and excellent, and praiseworthy, and, and, and get all that garbage out of your mind. And it says that the God of peace will, will guard your mind. And we can, we can have that in another aspect, but it's hard to have discipline on our own. You know, uh, eventually we reach a breaking point, and we end up snapping, and sometimes it's worse than in the beginning. And so, uh, you know, I've seen God be able to work through people's diets and people's uh, addictions and the things that they do that are bad for them. Um, you know, the, the libraries are filled with self-help books modern-day gurus and philosophies and all this other stuff. And, uh, and we can kind of train our mind for a, 
for a season or even a short period of time to try to overcome. Uh, but eventually we snap. I know so many people that are in a gym and they're, you know, they're, they're working and they're getting their body in great shape. But, you know, they're so intense and they're so into this that they have great anger issues. And they end up drinking a lot. And it ends up affecting other areas of their life because they've taken all their mental and spiritual capacity to uh, kind of harness this. And then they start dropping the balls in, in other areas of their life. And so, uh, you know, discipline is tough. You know, uh, I've only been able to do certain things to overcome things with, with faith is, you know, whenever I get, I need that, it reminds me to go to God to help me deal with that. And so whether it's sugar, whether it's sugar, you know, a little bit of sugar is not a bad thing. A ton of sugar is a bad thing. So I think it's discipline. I think discipline is really hard without, without faith. And so uh, after the next row of my sponsors, uh, I think we'll, we'll dig into another question. Hey, everybody, this is Motorcycle Mike, the personal injury lawyer. In addition to representing injured motorcyclists for over 30 years now, during that same time, I've represented countless car crash victims and construction workers injured on construction sites. If you need my assistance, go to my website, MotorcycleMikeESQ.com. I will always be there for you. This is Pastor Ski, and I want to tell you about two books that I've written, uh, The Fear of Life and, uh, and No Sting. Uh, the Fear of Life is my, uh, my journey of faith and how I lived in fear for uh, close to 35 years and how God took me out of it. Uh, no Sting is about my battle with cancer and my, my victory through God over it. And if you're interested in any of these books, go to uh, barnesandnoble.com, uh, amazon.com, and also zoolonpress.com. Go to the bookstore. And again, I want to thank you for your support. Welcome back to Answers from Mars Hill. This is Pastor Ski once again, and uh, as we uh, as we move on, you know, from uh, from those those first two segments, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's going on in this world that uh, people always want to blame God for, but we need to understand uh, really both of those segments that God never wanted this, um, but He's trying to redeem what He can with our permission in our really uh, looking to him so uh so bobby what do we have now okay so we have a question from jim J in slingerlands new york and i know where that is that's upstate I never heard I, of it i have some family members that <laughs> okay. live there um so his question is can i really get to heaven just by believing that jesus died for me don't i also have to live a good life it doesn't seem fair someone can live any way they like and just say i believe in jesus and go to heaven okay well that's a um kind of a misunderstanding of salvation in general obviously if it were that simple and and i think sometimes um, Christians do give an impression that uh, all you need to do is, you know, say a prayer, say, uh, Jesus died for me and I believe it, and, uh, and from that point on, you've met all the requirements. Um, and, you know, the Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead for, your, for our sins and for our, our resurrection, that's, that's really what salvation is, but then you have to look at what actually is that saying. If you believe Jesus with all your heart, your life shows that. So it's not a matter of just saying something. It's a matter of, if I believe, that means that I believe and my life is adjusted uh, accordingly. And so, 
to say that someone goes to heaven just because they believed that Jesus died for me. Now, if that's just a statement of saying that, that's not really the, the requirement for salvation. You know, believing is, is not just, you know, you close your eyes, you believe something, and, and that's it. You know, it's uh, believing is, is a life. A life believes. A life is evidence of belief. You know, the Bible calls it fruit. You know, when we actually do believe, it's not because we say we believed. It's because we actually stepped into a place where we surrendered our life to that fact. And so now our life reflects uh, the realization of that, uh, that fact. And so the first part of that question as far as uh, just, you know, saying you believe in Jesus um, that's, that's really too superficial an understanding to actually think that. So, um, you know, I hope I address that part of the, the question as far as just saying a prayer. It's not saying a prayer. You know, it's, uh, there's this um, uh, thought process called the Romans Road. In the book of Romans, Romans uh, Paul talks about the reality of the steps that, uh, that are, are need to be realized in our spirit and in our soul to actually step into this life, surrender, a real surrender, and actually have, you know, God's Holy Spirit come into us because now we've surrendered to, uh, to faith in Jesus Christ. And it's, you know, admitting, admitting we're sinners, admitting we can't reach out to God, that we're separated from God because of our sin, uh, a realized repentance, which means a heartfelt and soul felt, uh, I don't want to be that person anymore, uh, and it's forgiveness, uh, and then there's revelation, and then there's acceptance, and there's surrendering the rest of your life. There's, it's, believing is, is, is kind of a, a very superficial and not, not real um, explanation of actually what uh, stepping into the Christian faith, being what we call born again, which is, you know, it's, it's something that Jesus said. And so um, the second part of that question um, what about living a good life? I think the first part of the question was, don't I also have to live a good life? Now, with this faith and its reality, is when you have really believed and when you have actually surrendered, the Bible tells us, Jesus tells us, it's called born again, born of the Spirit, which means now we have the Spirit of God that comes into us, and so, by, by nature, we will, over time, become good people. We, uh, we lose more and more of our old, our old self. The Bible says dying the flesh, old man, new man. And so we start becoming someone different. And it's not that we're actually out there just doing good stuff. It's because inside, we're actually becoming good people that we become more like Jesus because we draw closer to him and we have his spirit that informs us, teaches us through his word how to, um, how to step into that life and what that actually looks like. So, um, you know, as far as having to live a good life, a good life should come naturally, little by little. Some people, it's a quick transition. Um, not me. You know, it was a wrestling match, you know, that, uh, that you, 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 you want to hold on to things, but then you don't really want to hold on to things. I mean, Paul even talks about this struggle. You know, I, I do the things I, wanted, I don't want to do, and I don't want to do the things that I end up doing. And, uh, and it's this battle we go through with this new spirit in us fighting the old spirit we had in us or the old man we had in us. And so the more you dig in, the more little by little you will become a better person. Uh, if you don't do that, what happens is you end up living a very miserable life. There are some people that actually have become a Christian, but they don't do their, their, uh, their disciplined understanding and learning. And so they're constantly in this battle uh, of torment between what the Holy Spirit wants to do in them and what they're not putting in enough effort to actually overcome. And so they end up being very uh, defeated sometimes. And then there's those people who, um, who just don't even try. Uh, they just say, I believe in Jesus, and they want to live any way they want to live. Well, that's, uh, 
that really shows evidence of someone who actually doesn't believe. You know, if you believe that Jesus was the Son of God, and you believe everything he says, because if you believe Jesus is the Son of God, then you believe that everything he said is from the throne of God, is from God. And now you have all these things about what, uh, what you should do. Jesus talked about hell more than he talked about any other subject, and most people don't understand that. Um, so now if Jesus is the Son of God and you believe in him, and this is the life he said you should live because it's better and it honors God and it's, it's better to show love and to show compassion and, and whatever that life issue is, then um, how can you say you actually believe believe in Jesus? You know, there is, there is a, uh, a term in the Bible called the fear of the Lord. And it's not a fear of God like some faith they have a God that they're, they're scared to death of this God. Right? And, and that's not exactly the way the fear of the Lord really is, is, um, is to be kind of understood from a Christian perspective. See, we are supposed to be so afraid of not being in the will of God that that next step we take is we're going to be taking that without God, that we're afraid of him not being with us and the consequences of that. And so that's what really the fear of the Lord is, is, is the fear that God is not with us. And, and that's a healthy fear. We're not cowering because God is is just big awesome and, and just a terrorizing God. We're afraid because we know that he knows the best life for us and, and he has a plan for us. And, and if we step out of that plan, only havoc and death and, and destruction can come out of it. And so when we really believe that Jesus is the Son of God, then we also believe that we should have a fear of not being out of that, uh, of our life being informed by that very fact. And if someone wants to go out and live the whatever life that they want to live, saying I believe in Jesus and that he's my savior and that he's the son of God, their life is saying they're lying. They're lying. I mean, there's no easy way to whitewash that. You know, uh, I think I spoke uh, at one time about a book called The Christian Atheist by, uh, I believe, Craig Rochelle. And it's talking about people who, uh, who say they believe in God, but they live like he doesn't exist. And so, uh, you know, the term Christian atheist really to me is, um, is, a, is a really a misnomer because in order to claim this label of being a Christian, you need to be a, a disciple and a follower of Jesus. That's the description of a Christian. It's not, I want to do nice things, go to church, sing good songs, and be a nice person. It's because we are followers of the Master because we are trying to be little Christ. That's kind of like what Christian is. We're trying to be just like, like him. And so unless that's a description of what your life picture is, then you're really not fooling God. You know, you may fool people who, uh, who just want to believe what you say, but it's really the, uh, the judgment that we have being a Christian. You know, the church is not supposed to judge the world. We're supposed to judge each other and help each other correct each other. And when, when someone we know that's in our faith, in our church, and like, you know, you're kind of veering off in that, you know, judgment doesn't mean we bring the hammer down. It means we, we kind of come up to the loving and say, you know, you know, I think you've gone off in a direction that you veered off the path that God has for you, and there's only, there's only danger coming down that road. And so as we, uh, as we understand the reality of what it means to be a Christian, um, don't stop believing that anybody that wants to say a prayer, anybody that says they believe in Jesus is is a Christian. Uh, there's a lot of people that are, are having good lives out there and they're doing good things. And, uh, and that's kind of all well and good for this realm of our existence. Um, but it doesn't help in the, uh, the eternal realm because uh, Jesus is the one who said, no one comes to the Father but through me. What gave him that authority? Well, being nailed to a bloody cross, dying for our separation, and, uh, and coming out of the grave gave him the authority to actually claim that. And so, um, you know, God is fair. And the reality of the Christian faith, when someone steps into it, God's going to be fair. We'll be back in a minute from our sponsors. Hi, my name is Sharon, Sharon Gillette. 
and I'm the owner of One Stitch at a Time. I've been doing this since I'm nine years old, but it became full-time when my husband was diagnosed with cancer several years ago. And I never went back to work because I wanted to take care of him. I feel what makes me stand out is that I care. I take a personal interest in your project. I take the time to find your correct fit and treat you like a friend, not just a customer. So whether it's embroidery, making patches, printing shirts, doing alterations and repairs, or bringing your ideas to life, you can call me at 631-428-1245 or visit my website at www.onestitchatatime.co. Welcome back to Answers from Mars Hill. This is Pastor Ski with the uh, the last segment of the show today. Um, following up maybe with that question that we we uh, we finished the last segment about, you know, can you just say you believe in Jesus, do what you want, and uh, and go to heaven? Uh, and we dealt we dealt with that a little bit, but I think Bobby's got some things he wants to expand on with that thought. Yeah, I just uh, you said uh, something about fear of the Lord. And, um, you know, people who don't understand, they, they automatically think, you know, oh, well, how could you be so scared of God, you know? And this was brought to me, like, once somebody said this to me, and I just tried to explain to them, it's not like I fear the wrath of God or anything like that. It's a fear of knowing that, one day you will have to face up and 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 be judged for your actions during your life you mm -hmm. know and knowing that you do something that's not good and terrible and hurt someone that's the fear knowing that you're gonna you're gonna have to answer for that you know that's not just something you do and you get away with and it gets forgotten about these are things that we fear at the end of our lives that when we do meet God, we, you know, he knows what we, what we, what we've done. And it's a fear of, of knowing that, you know, that we will be judged. Would you agree that is more of a fear of a Lord than fearing, you know, the wrath of God when, when we're doing good and, and we're on the right track and we're doing God's will. Um, I personally, I have a confidence that God, God is with me, and he's happy, and he's there for me. Mm -hmm. When I drift off track, not that God's going to abandon me, but I have that doubt. You know, I know that I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do, and in the back of my mind, I'm concerned that, that God is not there for me at that time, although he is. But, you know, as I'm saying, I feel more confident when I'm doing the right thing mm -hmm. because I know that I'm doing God's will and I know that he's happy what I'm doing. And when I do something wrong, that's the fear that I get, the fear that I'm going to have to answer for that, the, f the fear that God knows what I did yeah. that I shouldn't do. Well, yeah, that's, that's uh, really what the fear of the Lord kind of looks like. You know, talking about the end um, the end. Obviously, you know, within this faith that we uh, we hold dear Christianity, we believe there's an eternal um, there's an eternal reward and eternal consequences. And that is, you know, in the eternal big picture, that's the eternal big picture. And so, you know, the fear of the Lord here, 
what it does, uh, it keeps us in a healthy perspective here, but also with a backdrop. You know, uh, when I speak about this Christian faith and share it with people, um, I don't really share it often as, you know, as some people kind of call it fire insurance. You know, like saving from hellfire and saving from eternal damnation or whatever you want to uh, you want to describe it. You know, biblically, is that the truth? It's absolutely the truth. But I think in this life, people who don't have God should be in great fear in this life because they don't have, um, have God's will walking alongside them in their life. You know, I, uh, as I mentioned, the fear, the fear that I have, the fear, the healthy fear as a Christian, a believer, uh, we no longer fear uh, hell and death because we have been brought by the blood of the Lamb and we're, we're saved. If that is a reality, as I dealt with the, with the, last, the last question. Um, but we should be in a place that if we go off of that path, uh, to thank God that he will allow correction here. Because to face judgment at the end, there is no end to that. That wrath is forever. And so the fear of the Lord here, we're, we're going to face consequences here for us drifting off, uh, whether we believe in Jesus or we don't believe in Jesus. See, when I, when I think about the wrath of God, um, there's not a lot of times that, even, even biblically, that you see God coming down and bringing the hammer. More often than not, God's wrath is seen as a um, um, letting us receive the fruit of our bad decisions. So what most people don't understand is God has a protection on us. And we go through that life as a believer with protection on us. And so when we step out of God's will, we should be afraid because we no longer have protection on us. And we can look back in our life and we can see how there are things that could have happened to us and never happened to us. Um, but then there's times that we step out of God's will and we just, we just walk right into the, you know, into the buzz, the, the buzz saw. We walk into that, that, uh, that issue, that, that damage or whatever it is because we've walked off. And so uh, the worst thing that God can do to us is not be with us and allow us to, to actually live in the fruit of this existence. Mm. The most treacherous existence, I believe, and this is why Jesus said it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And it's, it's kind of like a metaphor. People have brought it all over the place. But, but the thing is, when people are satisfied and they're happy in this life, it's the most dangerous place to be. And so you know, people like myself who've gone through some hard things, challenging things, has brought me to an awareness of God. And so, you know, people are out there and they may have a lot and they might be doing a lot of good things and they feel good about themselves, but they don't have Jesus and they really haven't stepped into this faith, um, are in one of the most treacherous positions they could ever be in um, because they believe the lie of, of the enemy in this realm. And so, um, you know, when we, uh, when I, I went off on a tangent on that, I think. Did that answer <laughs> no, your question? Yeah, no, it absolutely does. <laughs> and I just want to say is like, you know, personally, when I'm, when I know I'm on the right track and I know when I have a, a, a good, healthy relationship mm -hmm. with God, everything seems to go really well for me. And when I drift, I notice I struggle. And, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, sometimes we just have to get back on track. Right. That's well, just my personal well, in experience. The, in the first, first John, uh, the Apostle John tells us there's, uh, perfect fear, ca perfect love casts out all fear, and perfect love is knowing God walks, God is with us, uh, and He loves us, and we're walking in His will, and our hearts are beating together, and so we're walking in love with God, and there's nothing in this world to be afraid of. Mm -hmm. So, that's kind of how you know perfect love casts out all fear. Gotcha. Okay, so we got we got time for one more question, and this is actually perfect. This is from Janine from Boston, Massachusetts, and at the end of the last segment, you said something, um, um, kind of paraphrasing, but Jesus said something to the effect that the 
the only way through the only way to my father is through him and this question is perfect for that and uh, she wants to know what about people who have never heard of the name Jesus what about people living in parts of the world that oh. have never been or not enough time for this question? With, no there's not enough time <laughs> because I, I, I'm, I was waiting for that question to come up okay over the last week or two because that's a very you know there's things going on in the world right now that 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 didn't answer that question a lot yeah so I don't, do you want me to start with that today? Well, yeah, why don't you, we can continue it next week. Why don't you just, you know, kind of just okay. give it a brief uh, thing. Yeah, right. because uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really, it's a good question. Well, the, uh, the, world, the, the Bible talks about, you know, if no one, no one uh, proclaims the gospel, if no one um, talks about God, no one shares God, no one shouts about a creator, uh, the Bible says even the rocks, the rocks will worship man. And we see Abraham. Abraham was 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 brought to awareness of God. You know, there was no Bible. There was no, no nothing going on. But he he had a, an awareness around him that that God there was God there that there was something greater than him that created all this. And so uh, you know, everybody asks about you know what about the people that never heard of Jesus? Um, well, a, a lot of people they're going to be judged within their own. Uh, realm and how God is going to judge them through the creative uh, mindset, um, which, you know, there's a lot of uh, maybe debate on that. But also, um, understand that the God of the Bible, the God that put Jesus, uh, allowed Jesus to go to a cross, is actually a real God. One of the biggest truths now, and we'll, maybe we'll discuss this some next week, right now in Iran, there is one of the biggest revivals going on in the world. Literally hundreds of thousands of people have, have started to form a huge Christian church in Iran during this time. And, uh, you know, the, the sanctions and the famine and the things they're going through. But over a third of those people have gone to sleep and have met Jesus in their dreams. Mm. Over a third of them. That's their testimony. And so the thing is, when you, you, uh, you, your God is the real God, which Christian perspective, but I'm talking about proofs, and there's a lot of documentation about this. There are literally thousands and hundreds of thousands of people in Iran, where even the mention of the name of Jesus is taboo, that go to sleep at night, and Jesus appears to them. And then after that, they're told to seek someone or you know, speak to this person. And there is a huge church that's growing in Iran with a lot of people that never heard the gospel of Jesus because they're not allowed to. Mm -hmm. But they go to sleep and Jesus uh, reveals himself. And so that answers part of the question about uh, what about people who never heard of Jesus. You know, when it's actually the real God that is real and the spiritual entity and uh, this, this whole faith is real. Uh, this isn't an idol. This isn't a small God. This is big G, big God, real God can invade even your sleep. So I want to leave that there. We can discuss that next yeah, week. Absolutely. Um, but um, as we close, I want to thank our sponsors, Motorcycle Mike, uh, Sharon Gillette, um, Wolfman Max. Um, if, you, uh, if you want to donate to the show, you can go to the uh, Rushing Wind Biker Church uh, website, rushingwindbc.org. Or you can uh, can text us at one six three one three five two seven 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 three. And uh, right now, uh, I know I'm on over for a minute. Um, right now, with the, the coronavirus and things going on, we're on uh, we're on live feed uh, um, services right now. Uh, nobody in the building. We have a, a skeleton crew putting on services. So uh, if you want to go to uh, my, uh, my Facebook page, or uh, we're going to try to maybe get it on the church, the church Facebook page, uh, you can check out our services there for at least the next two weeks or so while this, uh, this uh, virus scare is going on. So this is Pastor Ski from the Biker Church. God bless, and I'll see you next week.